Hi, this is Dr. Purcell. Let's talk about corticosteroids and the pharmacologic management of inflammation. We're going to look specifically at these two corticosteroids, prednisone and methylprednisolone. Even though there's many, many different ones, <clears throat> these are the two for our um, particular module. Quick review about inflammation. Think back to pathophysiology. Inflammation is an immunologic defense. So it is, we don't have a homeostasis, a, a, a normal amount of inflammation. Inflammation is a response to something and it's defensive. It is to protect us. And it, it is in response to tissue injury, to infection, or even to allergy. And so in this case, um, we're going to be focusing on asthma and COPD, more of the, oh, and, and bowel, um, inflammatory bowel disease. And those are all really tissue injury mediated inflammation. Don't forget, uh, back again to the patho, and in Lily on page 515, there's a great, great explanation <clears throat> about the adrenal glands and the secretion of the um, endogenous steroids in the body. The adrenal glands, you have two of them, one for each kidney. They sit right on top of the kidney and they, it's an endocrine organ and they have two very distinct parts. And honestly, if I were inventing anatomy and I were going to name this, I wouldn't say it was one gland. I would call them the two different glands, but you can't. Um, it is one gland, even though it has two distinct parts. We have the medulla, which is inside the inner layers, and the medulla is responsible for certain types of endocrine activity. And then we have the cortex, which is the outer layers of the adrenal gland. The corticosteroids that we are going to be focusing on come from the adrenal cortex, the outer layers of the adrenal gland. <coughs> Pardon me. So let's just look. Um, the color scheme is in intentional here because yellow and blue make green, right? So let's start at the top. Green is an overarching broad term, corticosteroids, very broad term for the hormones that are secreted by the adrenal gland. Remember, the adrenal gland can secrete hormones from the medulla or the cortex. So overall, Yellow and blue, glucocorticoids, and mineralocorticoids are all part of one big word, corticosteroids. Then you come down, the glucocorticoids are responsible for our metabolism of carbohydrates. And our primary endogenous glucocorticoid is cortisol. The exogenous drug that mimics cortisol is hydrocortisone. I think I spelled that wrong. It looks wrong. Anyway. Um, sometimes you might actually have hydrocortisone in your uh, medication cabinet or your medication drawer at home. It's, uh, you can buy it over the counter in a cream or an ointment, and we tend to use it on things like mosquito bites, or bug bites or rashes or things that itch to help bring down that inflammatory response that makes us uncomfortable. On the side of the mineralocorticoids, these are the ones that regulate electrolytes, the minerals in our body. That's why they're called mineralocorticoids. And that is focusing uh, with aldosterone. And do you remember aldosterone uh, is all about uh, sodium reabsorption and the whole sodium exchange with potassium. And so we aren't going to be looking at the mineralocorticoids today. We are going to be talking about the glucocorticoids. And their main effect is inhibition of inflammatory and immune responses. So that's why we want to look at these, because we're talking about the concept of inflammation. So glucocorticoids inhibit inflammatory and immune responses. How do they do that? They stabilize cell membranes of inflammatory cells, the mast cells, remember those inflammatory cells? They decrease permeability of our capillaries to the inflammatory cells. So that's two ways now that they work. And they decrease the migration of white blood cells into the already inflamed area. 
So the glucocorticoids, the way they inhibit an inflammatory immune response is first they work on the cell itself, the inflammatory cell, and they stabilize those cell membranes. Then our capillaries, where those inflammatory cells are traveling to the site of damage or injury, it works in the capillaries and it decreases the permeability of the capillaries to the inflammatory cells. So they can't even get into the transit system or not as many can get in. And so that decreases the migration, especially of white blood cells into an area that's already inflamed. Why is this a desired effect? Why is this important? Well, I want to show you a picture here of an asthmatic lung or even uh, somebody with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma or COPD, because the part of COPD that um, has to do with the inflammation and the mucus is the asthmatic part of COPD. On the right-hand side, you can see that oxygen and carbon dioxide flow or in, taking in and, ex and um, exhaling is, the, is minimized. The actual amount that you can bring in and exhale is minimized because of the swelling of the lining and the excess mucus. So the swelling is the inflammation. And with inflammation comes all the white blood cells. That is your mucus. So now what we have is congestion within the bronchial uh, airways. So back up here to what they do is they decrease migration of white blood cells into already inflamed areas. We really want to stop that into the lungs. We don't need more white blood cells. We don't need more of that in the lungs. It also works then on decreasing the inflammation of the overall area. Another picture to show you is inflammatory bowel disease, very similar. The two diseases that make up the category of IBDs is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And you'll learn about the differences between these two when you take your med surge course. But just so you understand, the underlying issue with both of these is an inflammatory problem. And so when you have that, what we give the steroids for is to help bring down that inflammatory response. And you can see here how the wall and the lining of the Crohn's disease on the left is thickened from an inflammatory response because it affects all layers of the, um, the bowel. Uh, and on the right, the ulcerative colitis, the inflammation there is not the wall, not the lumen, but the actual lining itself is ulcerated um, and red and inflamed. So those are two of the main focuses that we have um, why we want a desired effect on inflammation. So the most common indications for our steroids are GI diseases, such as ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and exacerbations of chronic respiratory illness, such as asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. If you've ever had bronchitis, you might have also been given steroids or a steroid injection, uh, because again, it helps to decrease the amount of um, white blood cell and inflammatory uh, migration of cells into the lungs, and because that causes congestion in the lungs and difficulty breathing. And there's our pictures again. So what are the adverse effects of steroids? There are many adverse effects, and I wanna to talk to you a little bit about these, and then we're gonna go into the drugs, because this really is about all the steroids. So cardiovascular effects, this is going to happen with the, remember corticosteroids is the overall umbrella. Then we came down to mineralocorticoids and then the glucocorticoids. Well, this actually is looking more at mineralocorticoids, which we aren't focusing on today, but I thought I would throw it in here because remember that when you see cardiovascular effects, it's going to have to do with fluid shift and sodium and potassium electrolyte changes, which are going to have a direct effect on the heart and on um, hypertension caused by excess um, sodium in the body. And then we have central nervous system and endocrine effects. This absolutely happens with our prednisone and our methoprednisolone. 
And someone doesn't have to be on steroids very long to have these effects. And I already mentioned that you might have yourself had bronchitis and received an injection or a short dose of steroids. And then we have people who have lifelong chronic illnesses like irritable bowel, or I'm sorry, inflammatory bowel disease who might be on steroids long-term. So right now understand you can, that we're talking about treatment that can be short-term or long-term. Now, the longer you stay on a medication, the more effects you're going to have. But I'm telling you right now with the CNS and endocrine effects, these happen with the steroids, even with short term. So I've highlighted here the ones that are really the ones that are the most common that you will encounter. I've not seen anybody have convulsions. Um, I really heard anybody complain of vertigo when taking steroids. I'm sure it happens. It probably happens at high doses. But the ones that they mostly complain about are headache, mood swings, or irritability, a nervousness, and insomnia. Insomnia is huge, especially, um, I'm going to show you a picture of a dose pack of steroids here in just a minute, but it doesn't take much. You start a dose pack, and within the first 24 hours or two days of taking it, um, people can't sleep. They're not able to sleep at night because of it. But luckily, that's a short term. It's tapering down. They'll be able to sleep again within a few days, but it really does lead cause all of that. And then under, under endocrine, please understand that the ones that are not highlighted here are primarily associated with um, long-term use, except hyperglycemia and the, I should have um, highlighted, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access suppression. Fancy, we're gonna talk about it. It's a big old long fancy name. Don't worry, I'm gonna talk about it here in just a minute. But hyperglycemia, Anyone who's on steroids, their blood glucose is gonna go up, whether they've ever had diabetes or not. So we will be looking for that. Let's see. The other big effects are on the GI tract. Steroids cause a lot of GI distress. It hurts, they can cause ulcers, um, especially with long-term use. Somebody can easily get um, an, a GI ulcer. It, with our older adults, whose lining in the GI tract is, is more vulnerable to any drugs that can cause this, they are more likely to have an ulcer and possibly a GI bleed from steroids. Weight gain for our long-term patients is huge. It does happen. And a lot of it has to do with that fluid retention. Pancreatitis is something we see with long-term use. Ulcerative esophagitis goes right along with the problems with the peptic ulcers and the erosion of the gastric lining. And then abdominal distension as well. But the most common GI effects that you will encounter, whether it's short-term or long-term, are the, um, the problems with upset stomach and it really making their stomach hurt when they take it. Oops, sorry. And then we have integumentary and musculoskeletal changes. These are going to be associated with long-term use. And you will notice if you see somebody who's been on um, steroids for a, a long time or many, many times throughout the years, their skin becomes very thin and fragile. You'll notice a lot of petechiae on their skin, maybe some ecchymosis. They have a facial erythema and poor wound healing, which goes right along with the hyperglycemia. But the poor wound healing, because we're, we're suppressing their natural immune response, so they're not going to have good wound healing. Uh, they may have muscle weakness. They actually can lose muscle mass and osteoporosis. And then, last but not least, I have one here that is a broken link. So uh, I believe that was the one where I said weight gain, because that's a big complaint of people who are on steroids if they don't like the weight gain. Moon face is um, typically a picture they usually show in most of the nursing textbooks of somebody that has a cushion away, cushion type of look, and their face is kind of a moon face from long-term steroid use. So let's say you're, give, you're administering uh, prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone. What about the patient who's on other medications? What are you gonna do? Well, I will tell you, there are multiple, many, many, many drug interactions between steroids and other drugs. 
And rather than being able to memorize every single drug interaction when you're using that, I want you to remember that with if you're giving a steroid drug, you're going to have to look up other drugs that interact with the steroid to make sure that you have um, safe medication administration. So your biggest thing to remember about interact drug interactions with our prednisone and methylprednisolone is that they have many drug interactions and you must, the RN must consult a drug reference to make sure that they don't have drug interactions with their patient. The other pieces that you'll need to remember, and if you think about the patho behind the steroids and the um, glucocorticoids and, and the whole functioning with the adrenals, is that um, if someone's taking a diuretic, and we, you haven't learned diuretics just yet, but you will, and there's certain diuretics that do not spare potassium. And so they waste potassium when the patient has, um, you know, when they urinate and we were pulling fluid out of them, potassium goes with it. Well, you can imagine that's going to lead to hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. And so if somebody is on one of these diuretics, this drug is going to maximize that. The problem on the second one here with aspirins and NSAIDs is that those drugs cause are very much cause direct damage and injury to the gastric mucosa. Well, so do the steroids. So if you give these drugs together, if they're on both of these types of drugs, it will have an additive uh, effect and increase the chance of gastric ulcer or gastric bleed development. If you give um, this drug with an anticholinesterase drug, if you have a patient with myasthenia gravis, you could have a problem with uh, profound muscle weakness. That's not one you need to remember for an exam in this course because that's very, very specific to myasthenia gravis, which is not very common. But the last one here is extremely common. I would say diabetes is pretty much a big problem in South Texas and in San Antonio. So the chances are that you might have a patient with diabetes who's also going to need a steroid. Well, what happens is it's going to elevate their blood glucose that may have been very well controlled for many years, but now it's not going to be well controlled because of the effects of the steroid. So what do you as the nurse need to do about these things? So let's talk about, okay, with the, with the um, non-potassium sparing diuretics, the problem is they can have severe, severe hypocalcemia or hypokalemia. So as the nurse, if you're giving both of these drugs, a non-potassium sparing diuretic and prednisone, you need to very closely monitor the electrolytes, especially potassium and calcium. So before you even give it, you want to know the baseline. Where do they sit right now before I give either of these medications? So that I will know if they're, it's even safe to give. Because if they're already low on potassium and you go ahead and give something that's going to make it go even lower, you're going to have a significant problem. So it's going to be very important that you assess the electrolytes and monitor them closely. If your client, your patient is also taking a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory, perhaps for pain or aspirin, low-dose aspirin for cardiovascular health, you are going to need to probably hold the NSAID or the aspirin while they're getting a steroid, which will you'll do in collaboration with their provider, or you're going to more closely assess them for signs of gastric pain or possible gastric bleeding. For your diabetic patients, one of the things you're going to have to do because they may need the steroid is you will assess and monitor their blood glucose levels very closely and you will be administering insulin in response to the, what happens to their blood glucose levels. Everybody is different. Some people, it will spike higher than others. It, it, we can't predict it, but you do have to monitor it and respond accordingly. So here's prednisone. And you can find the, the drug profile on page 518 in your textbook. It is the most commonly used oral glucocorticoid for anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressant purposes. That's why you're learning about it, because you will probably get it. Uh, it's also used to treat exacerbations of chronic respiratory illness, which is very common. So you will probably encounter prednisone. 
This is an intermediate acting with the corticoid. So there's short acting and there's intermediate acting and then we have our long ones. We like the intermediate because you don't have to dose it as frequently as, frequently as you do the short acting. So it's an intermediate acting with the corticoid. It has a longer duration of action than our short acting. So its half-life is actually 18 to 36 hours, which is very, very uh, desirable. And look at the dosage range. Look at how wide it is. We can go from anywhere as low as five milligrams to as high as 60 milligrams a day. And sometimes it's even higher than that, depending on the purpose and the indication for using the prednisone. And then we have prednisone sister methylprednisolone. And methylprednisolone can be given, um, it is also in an oral, I uh, didn't mention that prednisone is only available in an oral form. Methylprednisolone, however, can come in an intravenous form. So you can imagine you would encounter that in the hospital. And there's a picture there of methyl, of what it's called solumedrol. That is what a vial looks like. And what you have to do is there is a powder and there is a liquid and they are separated. And you push the cap down, you push the orange cap is pushed down and it pushes a plunger down through, the pressure pushes through and allows the liquid, the, the, I think it's normal saline, so chloride, and the um, methylprednisolone powder to mix and be dissolved so that it can be given IV. Uh, this is the most commonly used injectable glucocorticoid drug. It's also immediate, intermediate acting with that longer half-life that we like. Primarily, it's used as an anti-inflammatory or immunosuppressive drug. Is this sounding familiar? I told you, it's the sister to prednisone. It's just that it can be given injectably. You can inject it. Um, it's usually administered intravenously. It can be given IM as well. And there is a long acting formulation called a depot, and we're not covering that right now because it's used in very specific situations. And just so you know that most of the injectable um, formulations like the one we're looking at, you have a preservative called benzyl alcohol that can't be given to children younger than 28 days of age. However, I will say the one here, the Actovial that we're looking at, probably does not have that preservative, which is why you have to actually activate it and mix it at the time you're going to administer it because it lacks a preservative, which is why they're kept separate because it's only stable for so long. So what does this mean to you as a nurse? These two drugs that are given for inflammation. Number one, please remember that whether it's short duration or long duration, the oral and actually the IV formulations do work on, they do have an effect on the GI mucosa as well. But the oral, it, the prednisone is going to actually very much affect GI um, mucosa. You need to give this with a meal or a snack. They've got to have food in their stomach. It will help with their GI upset. You might notice that uh, along with, with the steroid, many times uh, there'll be an order for an H2 blocker or sometimes for a proton pump inhibitor to help with that GI irritation. Always teach these patients taking high dose steroids or long term corticosteroids to avoid contact with people that have infections or illness. We are suppressing their immune system. So they are at higher risk for an infection and, and um, not being able to fight off the infection. Uh, uh, as they should be because we've suppressed their immune system. They should always take their adrenal medications at the same time every day. Don't vary, um, especially these are people that are gonna be on it for a long time, most uh, especially. And they should not take these medications with alcohol, aspirin, or NSAIDs. All three of these also affect the GI mucosa. They, they're very highly um, damaging to the lining of the stomach. So you combine that with a prednisone and they're at high risk then for an ulcer or a GI bleed. It's also good to know the best time to give a glucocorticoid is early in the morning. And that is um, in the book, it explains about your diurnal system and biorhythms and 
in the body, but typically between six and nine, as close to six in the morning as possible, is the best time to dose this. There's another reason. It helps them um, with their sleep because um, the, the, if you give it at bedtime, it really makes the insomnia worse. So it's better if we give it in the morning. It kind of helps with the insomnia. Not 100% because you saw what the half-life is. So you know it's still going to have some effect on their ability to sleep. I need to say something about adrenal crisis. This is extremely important. Um, we, you never abruptly discontinue uh, somebody's glucocorticoids um, because it can precipitate an adrenal crisis. And that is a sudden drop in serum levels of cortisone. So all it takes, and I think I actually have it on the next slide here, right. So long-term use of steroids, they must not be stopped abruptly. They require tapering of the daily dose because administration of these steroids causes the body's own endogenous production of cortisol to stop. And that was that fancy um, word that, that's actually HPA. I have it abbreviated here. Let's see if we can go back and find that slide where it has it. It is right here. Hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis suppression, HPA, I believe that's what it was. So let's go where we were just now. So there's HPA. So what happens is it doesn't even have to be long-term. Uh, as soon as, as much as, as little as 24 hours of somebody starting their steroid, the body's own uh, production of endogenous cortisol is, uh, is stopped. It's, it's interrupted. So if you say somebody's been on it and they, they just stop it abruptly, they're not going to produce cortisol right away, which means you can have an adrenal crisis in the face of any kind of stress. So um, that it, it, the suppression causes impaired stress response, puts the patient at risk for developing a hypoadrenal crisis, which can even cause shock and circulatory collapse in the time of increased stress. And that means it could be surgery, it could be trauma. So if somebody is on prednisone and you know they're scheduled for surgery, you will have to start a taper off instead of just saying, don't take your steroids the morning of surgery. You can't do that. It has to be on a taper before their day of surgery. And as it says in the bottom box here, adrenal suppression can occur as early as one week after a corticosteroid is started. So let me show you what it typically looks like. This is a six day to, um, prescription for uh, prednisone. And each one of these little tablets represents five milligrams of prednisone. And this probably was for somebody with bronchitis or some sort of a respiratory infection, possibly an asthma exacerbation. And you see day one at the very top is one, two, three, four, five, six, that's five, that's 30 milligrams of prednisone. So that's a lot of um, steroid to really start kicking back that inflammatory response. But now what you see is the taper. The next day it comes down by one. And the day three, they're down by two. And by day four, they're only taking 15 milligrams instead of 30. They're at half already. And then it comes to day five and day six. Um, so it says here, unless otherwise directed, the first six tablets in the row should be taken on the day you get your prescription. And they can, the very first day, if they want to, and, and it's usually the provider will talk to them about it or the pharmacist, they can take two tablets in the morning two with lunch and two with the evening meal to get the whole 30 milligrams in. Um, the next day, it tells them how to do that again with their meals. And remember, it's telling them to take it with a meal. By that night, by the night on day two, they're having sleep disturbances and they're probably exhibiting um, increased appetite and irritability and mood swings. And that's gonna continue until well after day six when they have to get this out of their system. But uh, it, once they get down to taking it once a day, we want them to take it just in the morning. That's that last day. So overall, when you look at this, you, the, what's calculated here is what their overall dose is over the course of six days. 
which is, let's see, I haven't calculated this. So it's F6. Um, well, you can count them. <laughs> I'm not going to count them all. But you can see with their um, whole, it's 21 times 5. So that would be their total dose. And this is called a dose pack. And so you sometimes, it used to be that we would just give them a, a regular medication bottle and it would have all of these 21 tablets in it. And we would just write it out. The first day, take this many. The second day, reduce by one. Third day, reduce by one. Fourth day. And you can imagine that patients were always confused and not doing it properly. So the most common way for short-term use is to put it like this in a dose pack. So how do you evaluate whether or not your patient is having the desired therapeutic effect to their steroid? I showed you pictures of asthma and your um, inflammatory bowel. bowel. So what the way you know is that they have a decrease in, or a resolution of the problems, the symptoms, the manifestations. They should be able to breathe easier. They should have less wheezing. Their respiratory rate should be um, come down. The respiratory effort should be uh, relaxed. They should have um, a normal SpO2 uh, saturation if it was given for a respiratory problem, if it was for like a respiratory illness, say, you know, the illness should be subsiding, fever, cough, those types of things are going away. For the GI symptoms, the pain, uh, abdominal distension, swelling, cramping, things of that nature should also be um, going away as the drug works. So those are the things that you look for. You wanna see a resolution of the underlying manifestations of the disease. That was the reason that you gave it. Um, very often with steroids, there's a, a nice sense of well-being. People get an increased sense of, oh, they feel good. It feels good to be on the steroids. Uh, if it was given for joint pain, you should see less joint pain, less discomfort, and overall the uh, an improvement in their condition. And that's how you know whether or not they um, have had a therapeutic response. So this is just the short and sweet about prednisone and methylprednisolone um, for inflammation in the respiratory tract and the GI tract. Thank you and happy studying.